Okay, really, I mean, have you heard anything is moving? Uh, what, and you know, in the respect for time, she left out some things from the chapter <laughs> so that when you read it, someone, you'll remember that as good as this is, there's still more in that chapter. Um, it's really remarkable, Alice McDermott is not only an emotional writer, what is astounding to me as you read the book and reread the book and reread it again as I have is to see how wonderfully put together it is. What the doctor says about no anesthetic for a good outcome. Well, Marie's been told that earlier. She's been asked by an angel, really, <laughs> yes. a um, large woman on the staircase who's sitting there. Her friend's, her best friend's mother has died, and this large woman gives her a penny and tells her to go to church and light a candle and pray for a good outcome. And Marie won't go. Marie won't learn how to cook. <laughs> Marie is a naysayer, but she is brave. And she is her own good outcome. It's her courage that has to be assembled in this book. And in order to do so, how did you build it? Because it, she dies alone. Yeah. She dies well, alone. She's got another angel in her life. With another <laughs> <Yes>. angel. <laughs> and these people are never announced as angels. Who are, th what are angels? Is this a philosophical or theological question? <laughs> Both. <laughs> well, Answer in two parts. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, first, I want to say there's there's no what a wonderful reader Michael is, and 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 he says that um, I'm not among that chorus of writers who say it's so wonderful to talk to Michael because then you learn what you've done. But I am among that chorus um, of writers who who are are amazed and so grateful um, for all you need is one careful reader, and you can <laughs> you know, and you can retire, um, and it's lovely uh, to to have that in Michael. And yes, the the presence, um, and, and maybe, you know, sometimes I think I'm not as subtle as I think I am. <laughs> you know? uh, the, the, You're the very subtle. Well, yeah, but it's there. It's, I mean, uh, the woman on the stair um, is, uh, she, she has a, a damp apron on, she has those golden curls. Uh, she appears again in the scene that I read. Um, she's the one with the sponge. Um, and, and uh, the vinegar and water trying to get her fever down. Um, so she, she has a, sort of a little Alfred Hitchcock type uh, <laughs> passing Cameo. in the background cameos uh, throughout the novel. And, and for me, I think um, I look for those characters to appear when I'm composing, or certainly in composing Marie's life, um, because I think they must be there. Um, I think that that sense of you want to look at a character, you want to look at the life uh, as honestly as possible. Here is a woman who has essentially an ordinary life, um, no great shakes, no major tragedies, and no, no great triumphs, um, but it's her life. Uh, and there's you know, there's always the possibility of dismissing such a life. On the other hand, there's also the possibility of making too much of such a life, um, of giving her a dramatic tragedy or a dramatic triumph. And, and so I find myself looking for those, um, if, if we look authentically at what our time on Earth is, 
bookended by these two darknesses, as Marie describes it, uh, the darkness before the first light, which is birth, and then the darkness after the end of life. Uh, when we look at, at what time in the light that we have, um, I, I'm, 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 I'm always sort of summing that up with, with the words of Yeats, um, man is in love and loves what vanishes, what more is there to say? And we know we're all mortal and, and we only have this time and I don't want to sentimentalize it and don't want to make promises about it that exceed what it is. But somehow, somewhere in that light, there must be these moments of grace. There must be these ordinary, unexpected moments um, that, that give us comfort, that there is comfort to be found if we look. Um, so that's how I think I look myself almost as my first reader. I look for those moments as I'm composing the novel to say, this, yeah, okay, it's, it's authentic, it's, but it's also possibly um, something we've never considered, something, a visitor. Um, an angel, <laughs> a saint. You know, well, that's one of the things I understood when I was thinking about Orion in the sky yes. and Orion yes. on Earth, yes. that in addition to this horizontal first light, last light, there are angels, saints, priests, <laughs> comedians. <laughs> I think I might flip that, put the comedians first. <laughs> <laughs> and they are, pardon me, because you see, I think that Alice McDermott, most writers who move me to tears, they move me often to unearned tears. Alice is one of the very, very few who works her structure so fully, so carefully, that I would say, if you'll pardon me, that that first light, last light, is the horizontal axis of her books, and that realm from the devil to the angel is the vertical axis, and that various forms of prayer form the coordinates. Mm -hmm. It's like the books read the decades of the rosary and they are given a pattern in which angel, saint, priest, comedian make reappearances during different decades. Right. Am I right? Yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And you do this with enormous clarity and care. It's not unconscious, it's designed. It's designed, certainly. Um, uh, but that, that's after all the unconscious stuff has been cleared away. <laughs> um, yeah. it's, it's, it's designed, but it's not a design that I can claim to begin with. Right. It's not a design that it's, found. that it's a found. It is. It's a discovery made within the composition through the language, um, through that sort of working at words. Um, sometimes one of the hardest things to convey to young writers when you're teaching um, is that the, anything that's really going to be wonderful in your work is not what you're going to think of and then bring to your desk. It's what's going to be conjured as you struggle over the rhythm of a sentence, finding the right word, choosing the right detail, saying it as succinctly and effectively as possible, all that sort of workaday stuff, which you know, I suppose for for journalist or or memoirist, it, that that you have a story, um, and now you're just finding the words to to put it down. But for for a fiction writer, and as I say, it's a hard thing for for young writers to understand. It, the words itself, the, that's where the story arises from. That's where, that's where things you didn't know you would see when you start begin to make themselves clear. Now, I think in addition, these 
discoveries of structure and form conceal and make taut what would otherwise be unbearable emotion, that you really are someone who's aware that pure emotion would be cheating almost, <laughs> um, th that the job of writing is bringing it, the material, to the point where it is written, and written means structured and designed. I want you all to forgive me because I tend, and I know it's wrong, I tend to describe this as needlepoint, and it's very wrong to talk to a woman writer and say she does needlepoint. What I mean by this is that the work is done with such extraordinary specificity and such close work. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm very familiar with these books. I was delighted to have this opportunity to read them all again, but there's so much worked into them, into the design. So when you say you fear you're not as subtle as you think you are, maybe I'm hallucinating <laughs> the, the depths to which these books master their materials. And some of it is designed. And here comes the question, are you ready? <laughs> I'm sorry, I love her so much that I go on about her. Um, that some of what's hidden is the design of the Catholic universe. Would you say so? I think there's something to that. <laughs> Definitely, yes, yeah. Um, no, no, please say more, because I'm very <laughs> interested. Well, again, I think um, it, it does come, it, it, it comes down to um, you know, attempting to look at life itself, to, to portray it realistically, authentically, um, recognizable people who behave in recognizable ways, um, uh, in, a, in recognizable situations, um, to, while, while really aiming for that kind of, of honesty, I guess is the simplest word for it, um, to also shake every sentence and every moment and every detail and say, but there must be something more. More than just think. the everyday. It, right, right. The, the spiritual, exactly. the revelation. Some revelation, something, and, and, and that's, that becomes a challenge um, only if you make sure that the realism is real. You know, if you're committed uh, or commit yourself to um, being, uh, being an authentic observer of your characters and their situations, it's easy to manipulate the reality to maybe prove a point about um, faith or um, other realms. Um, but the challenge for me is um, to, to look at it clearly, even you know, with the full expectation that there may no, be no re reverberation in this detail, in this gesture, in this circumstance, um, but to examine it for that um, and, and to try to see it so clearly so that the revelation is not something you begin with, it, it's the revelation is at the end of the process. It's a, a going, looking at reality so closely and so carefully with a cool eye and, and without any theology or theory, um, but just simply what is it like, what can language, how can language expose what's authentic about our existence? And if language exposes it in the right way, does it show us something we don't often see? I, I, I think of it as being like holding it to your ear to see if it's hollow. And if there is something inside, you want to catch it. It's, it, it has to be found. I, I want to, um, you see, I get very concerned because as far as I'm concerned, Alice McDermott is a writer who people like a lot. She doesn't lack for appreciation. 
what she lacks for is understanding. And, um, you know, the extraordinary care and beauty which comes into counterpoint with the wrenching emotional depth of her clarity of vision. So I was, if you'll pardon me, I was reading uh, the previous novel after this, and I wanted to read you the first two paragraphs, because here's a book. Alice has said to me that someone, more than most of her novels, came easily and was not subject to design. But in, after this, you get so many incredible skeins of image and theme. It's not, we're not talking, please understand me, we're not talking about symbols here and that kind of high school stuff. We're talking about image and the way it works and moves you. And running through this is going to be a lot of things blown by the wind. I would say the secret subject of the book is gone with the wind. It's about, yes? yes, sir. yes. It's about a past that is no longer retrievable. It's about the arrival of the 60s. And um, we are told at the beginning that battlefields have grit and pebbles and dirt blown across them. And yes, we're not sure why we're being told this, because we're being told about the alley next to the church. Why, why a battlefield and wind? And then, I want you to listen carefully, this gets buried too because there are rhymes and couplets buried within these first two paragraphs. So, I'll, I'll re should you read it? Yes. No, you, no, you go ahead, you go ahead. I've, I've heard enough from me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Leaving the church, she felt the wind rise, felt the pinprick of pebble and grit against her stockings and her cheeks, the slivered shards of mad sunlight in her eyes. She paused, still on the granite steps, touched the brim of her hat and the flying hem of her skirt, felt the wind rush up her cuffs and rattle her sleeves. And all before her, the lunch hour crowd bent under the April sun and into the bitter April wind, jackets flapping and eyes squinting, or else skirts pressed to the backs of legs and jacket hems pressed to bottoms, and trailing them, outrunning them, skittering along the gutter and the sidewalk and the low gray steps of the church, banging into ankles and knees and one another, scraps of paper, newspapers, candy wrappers, what else? Office memos, shopping lists, the paper detritus that she had somewhere read, listen to that read, or heard it said, read said, trails armies, or was it, she had seen a photograph, the scraps of letters and wrappers and snapshots that blow across battlefields after all but the dead have fled. <laughs> now you see, of course, although we can see how carefully done that is, most people read with their eyes, not their ears, so they don't hear it. It's one of the things that William Gass talks about a lot, one of my favorite writers, that you have to hear, that unless you're hearing, but the poetry here seems to be central to your way of working. Yeah, um, because it, it is out of the language itself, for me, that everything rises. Um, the character, story, theme, um, the, the sense that, um, again, not a, not a predetermined 
situation, plot, whatever you want to call it, but um, something that comes out of the language itself. So that writing that first scene, and yeah, what you know, my nose to the page is is to to get the sound, to to get the sight, to get the to, to, to get the vision, to, to, to get the world to come alive. Um, and that's what I'm, you know, that, that's the workaday stuff. That's, you know, I'm just hammering away at the sentences to hear that, to hear that. And then the same way you hope that a reader, a careful reader, will make note. I, as my own first reader, make note. Battlefield, all but the dead. Um, now, as story begins to develop, this is a story of a family um, through, as you mentioned, these sort of changing times, uh, the World War II generation moving into the Vietnam generation. And I see that I've written an opening like that, and I say, this family is bound for loss. Um, and, and, you know, and then I get up and I do things, I've, you know, put the laundry in or something, and I'm saying to myself, oh my god, you can't have a kid die in Vietnam in your book. Oh, please don't write a book about a kid dying in Vietnam. Uh, but on the other, the, but the words say, no, you must. Um, this, this is inevitable for this family, and these things happen. Um, you must be honest about it, and, but, but the, the, the language is what requires me to tell the story that I have to tell. And the rhyming and the recurrence of the image of that wind and things blown around in it, the telegrams that will come announcing a death, all kinds of things. But the rhymes enter the plot in a peculiar way so that eventually, like a rhyme, what will happen during the 60s inevitably in a Catholic family, there will also be an abortion. But I'd say brilliantly and subtly, it's not the daughter of the family, it's her friend next door. But not just that, the friend next door is not old enough to go for an abortion, so she borrows the daughter's identity card. So written down on the record at the office is the daughter. She hasn't had an abortion, and we're not going to do anything obvious. They're not going to call the parents and say, your daughter has had an abortion. It was the other. No, it's just another subject rhyme, which is part of the density of the time, and a writer who is refusing to do the obvious over and over again until the unobvious becomes like a dance or a ballet or a overstructure. And within that arises, as you were saying earlier, those surprising, unexpected, um, and, and, and maybe subtle <laughs> um, moments of astonishing grace of generosity, of um, relief. Um, right after that passage that you read so beautifully, thank you, um, the, the main character uh, has, she's coming out of the church because she's gone in to just sort of say, she's not married yet, God, whatever you want, you know, send me a husband, don't send me a husband, just, and she comes out to this windstorm that she equates with Harold Lloyd or Buster Keaton and thinks, well, God must have a sense of humor. Um, and, and, and just th those comedians appearing. Um, Buster her Keaton appears, Harold Lloyd appears, um, so do the Marx Brothers. Um, and on the very last page, in a very indirect way, so does W.C. Fields. Um, W.C. Fields has a movie called It's a Gift. Um, but a preacher talking to a pianist is asking him where he got his ability. Was he born with it or was he... Um, he practice a lot. Practice a lot. And 
Um, the young man says both, but the priest says it's a gift, which is the title of this very cynical W.C. Fields <laughs> film. Um, in a certain way, you get the feeling that something else is going on under the surface of this scene, that maybe the priest and the young man are forming a romantic well, it's another, he's another angel, too. He comes yes. out of, um, and, and again, it was, it's, and, and I have to say, um, I knew that, that there was this motif. Uh, because if I'm, going, if I'm going to write a novel about a family that confronts the, the worst thing that can happen to the family, the loss of their eldest son, the loss of a child, any child. The, if I'm going to write a novel and try to authentically portray that, without pathos, without manipulation, then there is the question, you know, but what else is there? Is there any comfort to be found? Um, and among the, the angels, the, the moments of grace, the people who enter at just the right time um, to give some relief, not an answer, you know, not a, oh, now I feel better, oh, you know, um, I, I, I lost 30 pounds and I ran a marathon and now I don't really feel so bad about having lost my son in Vietnam. <laughs> you know? um, but, but rather from within the life, without diminishing the terribleness of the loss, to still look at the life and say, is there any comfort to be found? And, and even those ordinary moments of laughter, the, you know, the crazy of, of Laurel and Hardy and the Marx Brothers and <laughs> Harold Lloyd, um, the moments of relief. Um, but I have to say, when I wrote the end for after this, and I actually thought the novel was going to go a little bit longer, but when the priest said it's a gift, and I knew it was the W.C. Fields, and I sat back and I thought, there's probably never going to be a reader in the world who will understand <laughs> that, that this, this last, these last words of this novel echo back and, and it's all about that there is some comfort to be found and that doesn't diminish the sorrow that, that is our mortal life as well. And it wasn't until I had an interview with Michael, um, did a but did a book tour, review, nobody, my editor didn't get it, <laughs> nobody. And it's just, well, you say, okay, well, I'll just sit here and enjoy it myself, and it will never be, no. and Michael, first thing he said was, that's the, the, that's the job. Do you mind if we go on for five more minutes? Okay, I, I, think, I, I think we should. Um, can, can, I want to know, because you see, I'm a reader of novels, you may know this, and poetry. But I'm a sentimentalist. I weep a lot when I'm reading. Sometimes I think it's not real weeping, but just that my eyes are needing to clean themselves. But I'm very curious. These moments of grace and comfort do not dilute the sadness, and the sadness does not eliminate the comfort and grace. That's a really hard balance to attain. How, how do you attain it, and how do you know when you've attained it? I don't know that it's. I don't. Know, I don't know that it's something that you attain. I. I think it's. Um, I think about my novels as as offering a proposition, um, not a proof, but a proposition. Um, here are these lives, uh, and here are these lives that are taking shape through language, um, through through the. The, the work of, of words are the great good gift that we have of our language and our ability to express uh, so much that can't be said through the manipulation of language. Um, and, and, and there it is. It's, it's a proposition. Um, not so much, I mean, um, 
speaking again of, of after this, uh, uh, one of one of the things that that sort of made me compose this novel in the way that I did um, was thinking about right after 9/11. Um, when the New York Times was doing all those individual profiles of everyone who had died uh, and on 9-11. And um, the photographs, well, it happened in early September, so so many of the photographs were at the beach or they were Christmas or holiday, you know, well, well, recent photographs. And, and I found myself sort of admiring humans, us. <laughs> for our ability to look at those photographs, look at the young father or the, the mother or the, the college student, or who, look at those photographs and we can recognize the joy. We can, we can recognize the, the love, the affection, the life, in the, even as we also understand that that life has ended and that it ended horrifically. We can hold those two things in our mind. One does not eliminate the other. We don't look at the picture and think only of the tragedy. And, and, and yet we look at the joy knowing of the tragedy. We do hold those things. Um, I don't know how we do it. Um, it's astonishing. Um, and, and, uh, and it is, it, it's, it's a great, it's a, it's a great uh, gift to us that one does not eliminate the other. Often they battle, you know, but, but the terrible things that happen do not send us into despair. And, and the lovely happy moments, maybe as my Thanksgiving story now that I'm thinking about it, maybe that's what, um, you know, don't, don't blind us to all the other possibilities. That's, that's us, that's what it is to be human. It, it astonishes me. Um, I'm, I'm filled with admiration uh, for this capacity that we have. And so I think of my novels as just saying to other human beings, look, we do this. These people do it, we, all, this, we do this. It's, it's, it's making love after you've been told not to have another child. Yes, yes, right, right, yeah, courage. Courage, <laughs> yeah. I also want to mention you know, Flannery O'Connor had just finished writing Wise Blood, and she gave it to Sally Gordon to read. And in a magazine, actually, that, that John Irwin we were talking about last night, a magazine he edited called The Georgia Review, they published. I don't know why this hasn't been republished. It's of more use to a young writer than yeah. anything I've ever seen. Yeah this woman Sally Gordon's notes on Wise Blood and what Flannery O'Connor, it was her first novel, you know, what she should know. And Sally Gordon says to her, we have five senses. In your descriptions, unless you include a majority of the sentence, of the senses, you don't have what you're describing on the page. You must have at least three out of the five senses in, this, in a description. Now, I, you see, I think that that balance, in your work, yes, you have a lot of extraordinary sensuous detail, the vinegar, the sponge, all that feeling going on. But I think that what Sally Gordon was really talking about was not about how to describe something, but how to make life on the page. And that mourning and laughter at the same time is how you do it. The extraordinary gift to give us the majority of human feeling so that nothing feels left out. By the end of the book, oh, a complete thing has been made that will contain a 
good, good majority of what can be felt about these events. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it dazzles, dazzles and impresses me. Can you say a word about how you do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, the five senses are, are very helpful to us. Um, but but I, again, I think it's that um, if, if, if you're not creating vivid life, then there's room for manipulation. Um, if I, I think I, I, I don't, even though you know I'm labeled as a Catholic writer, and, and Catholicism is is you know is part and parcel of the way I see the world and the way I use language, um, and and the shapes that I give to stories and to my own life. Um, but but I I I really go to uh, fiction as a way to figure out, not not to uh, to confirm. Um, and it seems to me that it's, it's in that vivid life. Um, that, that's, that's my first, and that's, in some ways I feel that's my only obligation. If I um, uh, work hard enough to, to bring to vivid life through language the world of these characters, then the connections, the, the, the the stars and the uh, all the way down to that will reveal itself. Um, not something I can bring to it, but something that will be revealed in and of itself through the process. Um, and 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 so yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to make it vivid, make it real, because I have discovered that through as a reader first, um, and then as a writer myself, that in that vivid life can be found things that we only intuit and that we don't even quite have language for what yet. What we call mysteries. 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 I appreciate that answer. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Alice and I will be in the lobby. Um, I'll be there just to say hello. Alice will be signing books, and we hope to, that you will come and get your book signed. Thank you. Thank you again.